Welcome to the Untold Civil War. I'm Paul, and I'm sitting with John Messner, who is the author of one of my favorite books, A Scottish Blockade Runner in the American Civil War, the story of Jonas Wiley of the Steamer Advance. And uh, I have his book right here. But of course, he was fe featured in uh, Military Images Magazine, which is a sponsor of the show. And uh, what I love about this, not only did he have an article in here, but uh, I was also featured in the same uh, edition, which is really cool. Because I think, uh, what's it? Uh, I think uh, I interviewed you and put you guys together, right? And that worked yes, out. Yes, that's so right. Let's see if we can get that on camera. Yeah. I'll probably just post pictures up. But ah. uh, it's really great to uh, see that we're both featured in the same magazine. Yeah. But it's, it's I great wanted... to speak with you again, Paul. It's great to see you again. So uh, it's it's great to see you. I'm I'm glad you could come on because after airing our episode, I got a lot of questions about blockade running that uh, needed to be answered. You know, I had a lot of listeners asking. One of the main things they wanted to know were what makes a successful, a good blockade runner. Um, so I would love to get into that. I guess to start, maybe we have to just quickly, briefly discuss you know, the blockade itself. What did these yeah. blockade runners have to deal with? What were they up against? Yeah. So just at the start of the Civil War, one of Lincoln's first proclamations is to set up a blockade of the southern ports. So what does that actually mean? Well, at the start of the war, the Union Navy had very few ships. Most of them were scattered around the globe. So it really was a blockade on paper. Ships could kind of come and go, for the most part, to the ports of Wilmington, Charleston, New Orleans, Mobile, um, only limited by the kind of the limits of the ports themselves, so the inlets of those and how deep they were and so on. But as the war started progressing, the Union started either purchasing or building its own or, or, or greatly increasing the, the, the fleet, and a lot of those became blockaders. So slowly, those ports of Wilmington and, and Charleston on the Atlantic coast it became harder and harder for vessels uh, to, to make its way through. So an interesting comparison is Jonas Wiley, the first ship that he was on that was going to be a blockade runner was called the Economist. And it was a screw steamer, so it was a steamer, but it was a larger kind of merchant vessel that made one run into Charleston in March of 1862. But by the time he got in command in September of that year, so just six months later, it was deemed that it was too slow and it would probably be an easy prey for the increasing fleet. So what that meant was that the, the private companies, the states that were involved in the blockade running themselves and supplying the Confederacy, looked for vessels that could outrun the Union vessels, the Union fleet, but could also make it into these ports, which were, uh, for the lack of a better term, challenging. So Wilmington, for example, had two inlets, both of which were quite shallow, quite narrow. Um, it wasn't a big port like a Baltimore or New York or even a New Orleans, which you probably see captured really in the war. And that's where these paddle steamers from Britain, specifically Liverpool and Glasgow, but also from the Northeast and London and Bristol, uh, these paddle steamers that were uh, powerful. Um, Jonas Wiley's first blockade runner, the Advance, had 350, 350 horsepower engines. So they were quick. But they were also, importantly, quite a narrow draft. So although they weren't big merchantmen, they had less cargo space, they can make it into these shallow inlets or shallow shipping channels of Charleston, Wilmington specifically, and, and for Wilmington, up the Cape Fear River all the way up to the city itself. And that's where, towards the end of 1862, in this 1863, these ships that are known as Clyde-built and Mersey-built becomes basically the... The idea that when you when you look at a blockade runner in images from the war, uh, in Harper's Magazine or so on, it's these vessels that you see. So just going off that, I know a lot of people have this idea that these are these ships that are going from Wilmington all the way back to Glasgow, to Liverpool, seagoing vessels. But that isn't true, right? No, it's not. I mean, these vessels, for the most part, were meant for coastal. Um, a lot of them in, in, in Glasgow specifically went uh, down the River Clyde to coastal cities. Uh, even before the railways came along, this was the way to travel uh, up the west coast of Scotland to all the little kind of small ports and towns. Uh, 
the longest trips they made were generally across the Irish Sea to Ireland or maybe over to the continent. So London to Calais or something like that, or Dover to Calais. They're not ocean going for the want of a better term. They're not designed for heavy waves of the North Atlantic. So what they needed to do was make that initial trip over from Britain to the neutral ports of Nassau to St. George's to Havana and Cuba. And that in itself was one of the more dangerous roles or, or, or parts of the actual trade. From those neutral ports, then they could use, although there's still open water between you know, a couple hundred miles between those ports, they can use their speed. They could take advantage of uh, New Moon, for example. And all the cargo they bring out of the Confederacy is landed at these British ports, is then shipped onto larger vessels, sailing ships, steamers that are out, out of the reach of any federal kind of search and seizure. And then they take all the stuff back over to Liverpool, to Glasgow, to London. And then they return with the guns, the blankets, the shoes, the food, whatever is being run into the Confederacy from there. Now, I know you mentioned uh, the paddles. So are these sail powered or are these steam powered? Uh, what are we looking at? Well, for the most part, it's steam. That's where they get their, their full speed. However, they still, for the most, they, they still, a lot of them kept a certain amount of sail. So especially on that initial crossing from, um, from Europe, because since they're not ocean-going vessels, they didn't have big enough bunkers for all the coal they needed for that long of a crossing. So whatever they could, at least on that initial voyage, they'd use their sails as well as an additional add-on to the, the steam engines. Uh, but once they made it over to the ports in the Caribbean and in the Atlantic, for the most part, they're relying on the, the steam engines to get them up to a speed and then to either sneak their way into the harbors, which they sometimes did at a low speed, or to make a fast run in and out if they're spotted. So, so far, I'm seeing that these ships have to be, they're steam powered usually, uh, sleek, smaller ships. But what about armaments? Are they supposed to be armed? Not at all. Not at all. Um, the whole idea about, well, maybe the whole idea, but um, blockade running is a merchant trade, if you want to call it that. Um, the guys who are opposing you call you a blockade runner. You might just refer to yourself as a merchant. Um, when you're captured, for example, you, you try to plead as much ignorance as you can. Like, oh, I didn't know there was a blockade on. Like, Part of the whole legal system of blockade running is you, you basically post a piece of paper at Wilmington, at Charleston, at Nassau saying, look, there's a naval blockade on. So you don't have armaments. You might have, you know, the captain might have a pistol or something like that, but there's no cannon. There's nothing used to fight off the blockaders. And there's a specific reason for that is that in the whole kind of legal system of blockade running, um, if you can be chased and you can run away. And if you make, if you do escape, that's, that's good for you, I guess. But if you're caught, as long as you don't offer any armed um, uh, any armed resistance, then there's no reason for the blockaders, the Union fleet, to keep you as a prisoner. That goes for the British or the European sailors. For the American or Confederate, whatever you want to call them, uh, sailors on the vessels, they can still be held as a prisoner of war since they're an act of rebellion against the Union. Um, but there's a great story uh, when Wiley's vessel, the Advance, was caught that several of the Virginians were putting on kind of their 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 best London accents to kind of you know I'm trying to make my way how my kind of thing to 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 try to convince the the capturing forces that they weren't um, American uh, sailors. So if you're a British sailor and you don't fire back, you just run, but you get caught, basically you get released. You get taken to a neutral port or taken to a northern port. Uh, and then you basically you just go about your way to maybe run again, maybe return to Britain. Maybe you've made enough money to do this. Uh, but the ships themselves, the runners would not have had any kind of armaments uh, and ever would have used them in any kind of way. All right. So if they don't have cannons on board or that sort of thing, uh, at least, you know, to utilize, maybe they're smuggling them in, but they don't have them yeah, to utilize. Yeah. 
and they have their speed. Did they use maybe deception tactics as well? Yes, yeah. Um, we, we think of naval vessels today, painted gray. You can't see them on the horizon. Well, that wasn't the case mid-19th century. Uh, even naval vessels then, you know, you know, the Alabama or Monitor Merrimack, they tended to be painted black or red or white to be able to be seen on the waves. But blockade runners didn't want to be seen. So one of the things they did, especially if they were purchased from say a route in Europe is they'd get over to Nassau and be painted gray. So one of the first thing, or like a light blue or a white, something to disguise them on the horizon. So that's one of the things they do. They'd also sometimes have telescopic um, smokestacks or chimneys that they could lower to once again, cut their, um, their um, silhouette on the horizon. Um, they'd, they'd cut down on their masts. Like I said, they'd still have some masts. Um, they sometimes, still had some of the, the the cranes that were being used to load and unload were still part of that. All of that was to use to cut down their um, their silhouette. There's even some that used piping to pipe their steam and smoke under the water so they wouldn't put a big plume up, which is a tell telltale giveaway. So there was you know physical alterations made to the vessels. Uh, they were also basically gutted of any um, kind of niceties, the advance was built with you know, first class cabins and, and, and deck furniture, de a deck cabin. A lot of that was stripped away to offer more space for cargo. So cotton coming out, obviously, and whatever was being taken in on order from the private companies or the state going in. Um, so that's the kind of physical alterations they made. And then the other thing they do is they would use uh, the natural environment. They would try to run when there was a new moon, so when it, when it was dark, so it was hard to see. They might use, they, they could, since it's shallow draft, they can get quite close to the beach. So they might use the kind of the sounds of the breakers and the waves to hide their engine sound. They can also use the kind of, kind of mist that gets, that gets churned up by waves to, to kind of, um, once again, disguise their silhouette. So the whole idea was obviously the best run would be a run where no one sees you and you never have to worry about being captured. Um, usually, someone might have spotted you, and especially towards the end of the war when the blockading fleets were, I mean, they'd have several kind of layers on each, on each of the major ports. Um, it became increasingly difficult for anyone to be, um, go in or out without being seen, and that's when you depend on your speed to outrun almost all of the Union fleet. So... You've talked about what makes a great blockade runner. You obviously know what a good blockader needs. I'm going to put you in the shoes of a Confederate representative, government official. He lands in Great Britain, and he has to purchase a ship to become a blockade runner. Who are you going to talk to? Who makes the best? Well, as I said, uh, most of the ships came from either Glasgow and Liverpool. So Glasgow had been developing steam engines and paddle steamers since the 1810s. They were one of the main kind of um, centers for this development. And Liverpool followed closely on. So those are the two places you'd probably go. It's at Bristol, London, Newcastle as well. But those are the places that not only have a lot of ships, because they're centers of, like I said, the coastal trade or the European trade, but they also have a lot of ship builders. So by the end of the war, you have ships, blockade runners being built to spec. So not being bought up from the, the shipping lines, but from the shipyards themselves. So if I'm coming over and looking for a vessel um, at the start of the war, you're probably going to shipping companies that already have vessels ready to go and offering them above board payments for them. Um, the Advance, for example, uh, it was launched in September of 1862. Uh, by the Dublin and Glasgow Steam Packet Company. So once again, just going across the Irish Sea. Uh, and it was purchased seven months into its career. And we know that how much it was paid for, but also we know that that company paid out a good dividend to its stockholders that year. So it sold several of them. So at the start, you're looking at existing ships. But by 1863, you're probably going to the shipyards themselves and saying... You built these other ones that we purchased or that this company purchased or that state purchased. Can you do me one, but in gray to start out with and no first class accommodation, all the things that they were doing 
altering the ships in 1862, 1863, while later in the war they're being built that way, steel hauled, fast engines, but they still suffer. They're still not ocean going vessels uh, for the most part. So they do still suffer that those problems getting from British waters to uh, the, the blockading ports. Um, so Jonas Wiley's second blockade runner, after he's captured on the advance, he comes back to Britain, gets another one called the Susan Bairn, uh, spec made blockade runner built in Glasgow by Aiken and Mansell. Uh, it goes over to Bermuda, but it has problems. It springs leaks. It even had problems going over the Irish Sea because they're building them. I won't say they're building them not to quality, but they're building them to a certain level that doesn't do well on that transatlantic trip. Um, so who's benefiting from it? The sailors are benefiting from it, um, who are getting paid extortion amounts of wages over anything else. The shipyards, the ship owners. Uh, but also the blockaders, the, 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 the sailors and officers on those Union vessels who, for the most part, sit there and are quite bored, but there's no danger involved. Obviously, it sounds good for them. But if they were to come across a blockade runner and they capture it and it's not sunk or burned, then if that's deemed a lawful prize in Boston or New York, then everyone on that vessel or vessels or even people on shore get a cut of the auction price of the vessel, of all the cargo. So just capturing one blockade runner could be you know, 10 months wages or something like that, to even more possibly. I'm just you know, speculating, depending on what's on the ship. So th there's lots of trade being made uh, and money being made in, in lots of ways. Unfortunately, obviously on the back of armed conflict and lots of suffering in the war itself. Uh, sadly, that still goes on today. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and explaining to us what makes a great blockade runner. Uh, if people are interested in learning more about uh, your book, I would direct them and put a link in the uh, description to our talk that we did on the audio side of things. Uh, of course, could you plug yourself as well? How can people get access to your book? Of course. Thank you very much, Paul. First of all, thank you very much for having me on again. I've really enjoyed all your shows. The kind of the the, the interesting quirking things behind the the big battles and the big generals and i think a lot of people like that so um well you can find my book on your usual uh online sources your amazons or your barnes and nobles there in the states if you're over here in the uk uh waterston's or wh smith's or the publisher whittles themselves have copies and then also if you're ever in glasgow if you find yourself on this side of the atlantic uh, the Riverside Museum, that's my day job. I'm a curator there. Uh, the display that we put up in 2015 about blockade runners is still there. And that was the kind of the the, the kernel of the, the history and the research for this the book and my uh, research into why it came from that. So the painting of his ship, the advance, is there in the display. So please come over and, and have a look at the museum if you're ever here. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you.